So um, we're looking at emotionally based school avoidance and the questions that have come up are. So first of all, um, how do we support anxious parents who are transmitting their worries to the child? Um, this is a really, uh, a, a very commonly asked question actually. So we've got anxious parents as well as anxious children and we're not quite sure necessarily where the heart of the issue lies here. I think the most important thing here is one of communication. So when you are the parent or carer of a child who is struggling to attend school um, then you can often begin to feel like it's your fault and there can be a lot of shame and worry and distress that's associated with that and it's also very emotionally draining. I say this as the parent of a child who's been through this cycle. Um, it's very very difficult and you can become you know quite worn down with it and, and very worried and very anxious the most helpful thing um, that the that the school can do and the other adults involved here is to be kind actually stop care for them just be kind a cup of tea and a listening ear i know it sounds really really basic but the number of times when i turned up to school in the morning having spent three hours trying to get my daughter across the threshold there and i was met with people expecting me to solve this problem because i'm the expert actually in that moment i wasn't i was an expert in my child maybe it didn't feel like it but really i was just a mess i just needed someone to give me a cup of tea a hug and be kind to me and reassure me that it's going to be okay, that we were going to work on this together, we were going to do our very best. So just be as reassuring as you can, be as kind as you can. Of course, you can be thinking about whether you can be proactively supporting them to seek things like um, a referral via the GP or to access kind of self-help and support for themselves. But your kindness and your care will go a really long way. The other thing that um, parents and carers need to be reminded of is the importance of looking after themselves. They need to be given permission to sometimes walk away from this problem and to exercise good self-care and to take time out from this worry and just to do something for themselves, to take a break from it. When they take a break and they look after themselves and they get a little bit of rest and relaxation in whatever form works for them, they're much more able to begin to engage meaningfully with this problem. So in just the same way that we wouldn't expect to explain in depth um, a, a means of sort of relaxing to a child at a time when they were highly distressed because they can't really process um, that that thought it's the same with the parent we need to try and create a sense of calm and safety for them too so that we can then begin to explore what we do next uh, next anything we can give or signpost parents to during holidays and in preparation for the return to school in September yes so um, It'd be good to know a little bit more about what you're looking for there. But actually, one of the things I would say is that the work that I'm doing here, and I'm going to be doing more work specifically on this topic, um, I am going to be looking to engage with um, school as well as home and the wider community. And we're going to be doing lots of work with school nurses as well. And we're trying to create resources actually that are kind of universally applicable. So actually, these things work best when we're all coming from the same hymn sheet coming singing from the same hymn sheet so having a shared understanding of what we're doing so actually what we need to be thinking is what support and training do we need collectively here and then making that available also to our, our parents and our carers and I know there are some parents and carers in the room here um, who um, are, are able to support I'm not sure if any of our colleagues from the particular support groups um, are here but I will look them up afterwards if you are here unmute and share is anyone here from not finding school for example Okay, maybe not, but not fine in school. And then the other one whose name has completely escaped me. But there are a couple of organisations who do specifically proactively um, support that can be really helpful. But the other thing you can do is if you've got um, multiple parents or maybe you've got some current parents and some historic parents for whom this is a problem is actually put them in touch with each other. So this is a really lonely problem. And yeah, there's some great support out there, but being put directly in touch with someone who's been through this, who might give you a bit of hope, maybe some ideas, but maybe just listen, can be really, really helpful. Um, and you can do that by literally just kind of linking them up. Um, when you're back in school, you might create a space and provide the tea 
maybe even a biscuit if you can stretch to that that can really help you don't necessarily need to do loads more than that giving people a space um, uh, to, to discuss can help um, and at the moment you might choose to do that virtually in just the same way your kids might be, meet virtually um, but I will look up Sophie if you make a note and I will send you a couple of links through to there are some really good kind of sources of support for parents um, out there which I will share um, and recommend it's annoying me that I can't remember the name now um, okay next uh, how do we support anxious parents who are transmitting their worries onto the child? I think we've we've probably somewhat addressed that in the earlier question. So lots here around the, the role of the parent. And I think it's really important to note, these are the questions that you've kind of asked and upvoted. Um, we need to make sure that we don't add to that stress and that anxiety by taking insofar as possible a kind of a supportive and solution focused approach which doesn't attribute blame the parents and carers will be doing enough of that themselves already what they need for you to come in is, is to come in and say this is not your fault this is nothing that is wrong with you this is nothing that is wrong with the child of course if you genuinely think it is the parents fault if there are child protection safeguarding issues here that's a whole another issue but in majority of cases this is not the fault of any particular person and attributing blame isn't going to help. And so instead we want to be supportive, safe, kind in our response and work together around the child. A really good thing to do here is to think about how can we build connections and shared understanding. And the best way to do that is to think about what's the thing we have in common. It's the child. So think about the things that we can uh, share in terms of our understanding and our care and our love of that child and celebrate what's great about them and use that as a, a beginning way forwards. Where the parent's anxiety is directly kind of triggering uh, the child's anxiety, we do sometimes need to tackle that head on. And I think it is worth thinking about how do we do things like create a good routine for drop off, for example. So drop off can be a particularly challenging time. And imagine if you put yourself in the shoes of the parent or the carer, this is a really anxious time. Is it gonna work today? Is he gonna go into school today or am I gonna get a tantrum? How's it going to be? How's it going to be when he gets there? Is he going to, is it going to be all right? There's so many worries for the parent. Of course, they feel anxious and stressed and worried and the kids will pick up on that. And one anxious person leads to another anxious person. So the parent, the carer trying to get themselves as calm as they can, they need to learn these calming and relaxation strategies too. That's really helpful. We can teach them some things around how they can try and communicate calmly, even if they don't feel calm. So um, Sophie, if we can send a link through to the calm communication course, that's a really helpful one. But the very basic thing here we can do is think about what we're saying and how we're saying it. So I always advocate slow, low, low communication. So even if we feel stressed, anxious, angry, if we can communicate calmly with the child, then we can begin to convey that sense of calm and the co-regulation can begin to kick in and they will begin to feel calmer. So we're talking about slowing down what we're saying, so physically making an effort to talk more slowly. We're lowering the, the volume. So when we're angry and anxious, we tend to speak more loudly. We shout, we want to bring that volume down so it feels a bit calmer. And we're thinking about lowering the actual tone. So speaking less high pitched in a lower pitch because when we're calm, that's how we would speak. Think about your favorite audio book that feels like it's kind of wrapping you up and giving you a cuddle. That's the kind of communication we want. So slow it down, lower the volume and lower the tone. And you can say almost anything. And if you do it like that, it comes across that little bit more calmly. And also it can begin to help us to feel more calm as well. So we kind of fake it till we make it a little bit. Another really helpful thing there is just to have one or two go-to phrases and you just repeat them like a broken record in those times of high stress. Um, so you've got your go-to phrases so you don't have to think when you're worried, you just return. You know, and they might be really simple things. It's going to be okay, you've got this, you managed yesterday, you'll manage today. And if you don't, you can talk to X. So whatever it might be that's reassuring to the child, explore that together at times, times of calm. That was a big answer when I said I thought I'd already addressed it, sorry. Okay, um, the next one. Um, what if the kids are going to a new setting with no familiarity? That's, a, that's a, a, a tricky one. And obviously lots of our children at the moment, we're worried about them missing out on the transition that we might traditionally have hoped and expected to do. So if they're going to a new setting and they're not familiar with it, what we need to do is think, how can we make this feel more familiar? Okay, so something is always gonna feel safer when it feels familiar. That might mean making one friend. 
That might mean having a 10 minute conversation with a member of learning support staff. That might mean going and looking at the school when it's empty and just knowing where it is. That might mean doing a practice day, getting up, putting the uniform on, having breakfast, walking to the school or going to the school in however you would and practice what that feels like. Try to think what are the small steps we can make to make the unfamiliar feel more familiar because what is familiar feels safer and safety will always help here. So think about what we can do. If you are working in school and you're thinking about how you're going to support a cohort of children to try and prevent, you might be here with your prevention hat on rather than having a particular child in mind. Think about how you can create a warm, comfortable and caring environment for all your children and how you can create that feeling of safety and familiarity. So you might be doing something like creating a video about how is this going to feel? What does it look like in our school? You can just shoot it on your camera, on your phone. It doesn't need to take you very long but just show the child around the school and it might be that children are returning to what used to be a familiar environment but it's going to be unfamiliar because everything's changed because we're in bubbles and suddenly you're only allowed in certain parts of the school or your classroom's changed or you're with a different adult have a think here about what are the things that will stay the same and what are the things that will be different and tackle that head on and reassure children with the things that will stay the same and try to make the new things feel more familiar by doing a virtual tour, recording a video, something like that, or even just, you know, writing it out and letting them know. But yeah, if they're going to an unfamiliar environment, think, how can I make this feel more familiar? And if you are a, um, a, a parent or a carer, proactively approach the school, the setting about it. Say, I'm worried about this. I want to make sure that my child can transition in successfully. Please, can you help me? And um, there will always be someone who is prepared to help you. Lots of them are on the call now. There will always be someone. Um, okay, next. Um, amazing ideas to get students to communicate and share in my breakout session, group 18. Please, can we pull all our resources somewhere to share? That's a really, really lovely idea. Um, Sophie, I'm going to leave that idea with you. Maybe we could do something like set up a shared Google Doc or Word document that people could contribute to after the session. Um, yeah, I'll let you think about that. Um, I think it's a lovely idea and I'd really like to think about how we can share these ideas. And if you've got good stuff to share, send it to Sophie and we'll think about how to share it. So maybe we'll set up a shared document of some kind. But in addition, if you've got resources and things that you think other people should see on the course, um, do send them uh, to us and we'll, we'll do what we can with them. Um, so many questions. Um, okay, next, how do we re-engage with school refusers? Um, so that's kind of really the whole crux of what we've been doing today. But if you've got someone who's got a history um, of, of this being a real challenge for them, and we're thinking, how do we begin to, to build that? I think my key advice would there would be work out what, you know, as we said today, really try and understand what the problem was there. Try and understand how we can make this feel different for the child it doesn't have it's not necessarily about it being different it's got to feel different for the child and think as soon as you can about what are the small successes that they might have and um, the other thing is that where a child's story is that they are a school refuser and i hate that term we, this is why we use emotionally based school avoidance now, but the old terminology and what everyone recognizes is school refusal. And that makes it sound like the child's made an active choice when often this might look like an active choice from the outside, but a child is driven by so many different worries and anxieties. But if their story is one of school refuser, we have not to underestimate how powerful that story is, both in the telling by their community around them and of themselves. So we need to help them rewrite that story and we need to help them reimagine themselves a little bit and to create a bit of a new identity. And so we need to think, how can we help this child to tell a new tale about themselves and to have a real sense of belonging and purpose within this school? How can we do that for them? Is there someone, something, somehow that they can begin to build a bridge and a bit of a connection and we can start to write that story again? Um, with older children, um, we need to think about how we can help them save face as well. It can sometimes be really embarrassing for them to return and they might be embarrassed and, and ashamed of things that have happened in the past. So we need to think really carefully about how we enable them to manage that if they're, if they're adolescent. And for some children, it can be that that relationship with the particular school is just a bit too broken and we might begin to think about would they be better off with a fresh start? It's always a last resort, but it is, you know, it, I mean, it's what we did with my daughter in the end and it's never what I would advocate first, but in the end, sometimes it's where you need to go and sometimes it's the right choice um, for the child and for the family and it's not necessarily in any way a reflection on any failing by anyone but rather that sometimes children just need a chance to reinvent themselves we all need that sometimes 
Um, okay, how can we uh, best engage children? How can we best support children who may already have underlying trauma or adverse experiences and or a co-occurring neurological difference such as autism or ADHD? That's a massive question, Liz. Um, um, I think that's kind of, that's a whole nother session. Um, and so with permission, I would, I would be really keen to pick that up and run with it. Sophie, when you send the notes out for this session, please also send the notes from the session we ran last week about um, supporting autistic children to return to school, because I think that will, um, um, that will help the, the, the question here. Um, but it's, it's, it's just very, very big to go into. But many of the similar things that we did here, and I think when we're thinking about how we support children with special educational needs um, to return, um, actually, what we need to do for one we need to do for everyone so i'd almost usually flip the question and i'd be thinking about how can we all use the ideas that we normally reserve for our learners with special needs and use them to make everyone feel confident and happy and safe and welcome and, and that sense of belonging um, here i think it's about understanding that there might be some particular issues and um, that might be different for these children so for example it might be that for the autistic child the wearing of the school uniform is a massive barrier to them and you might have overcome loads of other different challenges but actually the minute they put that school uniform on it feels deeply uncomfortable for them and this is the thing that's stopping them engaging try and work out what those obstacles are and just think can we be flexible here? Um, and the other thing is that for our children with special educational needs, we need to think more carefully about how we communicate this to and with them. Um, and finally, that we make sure that we take, again, that really genuinely uh, child-centered approach and that we take it as slowly as we need to. Um, we will not succeed in the long term if we try to succeed too quickly in the short term. That's hard because you will often be uh, met with challenge that you've got to turn this around really rapidly. Um, yeah, you, you probably can make a difference really fast, but will that difference be sustainable? Will that child actually be happy and ready to learn? Maybe not. Um, I'm supporting a child who has witnessed domestic violence against mum and this has been impacting his feeling of safety to go into school. How could we address this? Awesome. I, I'm trying to think how best to answer that. It's so big and so difficult and so challenging. The most important thing here, I go back to it all the time, safety. The child needs to feel safe. The mum needs to feel safe. They both need to feel safe and know that the other one is safe. So a key thing here will be that the child will need to know if they've seen, they've witnessed this, they will need to know that when they leave mum in the morning that she is going to be safe today um, and that will often be for a child who's witnessed domestic violence that will be their overriding concern it will stop them being able to engage with anything any kind of learning is mum safe knowing that mum is safe and you might need at the beginning um, if that is the, the the issue here and I've seen it many times it might be that actually we do regular check-ins with mum without throughout the day and we're able to begin to wean that off but each might need to have that reassurance that yeah and that might be a text it might just be a really quick check-in it might be a five minute phone call at lunchtime and um, it, it can be very little things but just that reassurance that yes she's still safe and gradually we begin to then broaden that out and we realize that we can go the whole day um, and it's okay the child also needs to know that it's okay for them to be at school um, and they do need to be given permission to relax and have fun and to be their own person as well as worrying about the things that they they've seen um, and of course there's the much wider piece there around how we support and respond um, to that trauma but yeah in terms of enabling them to attend in my experience the biggest barrier here is the child feeling they can't leave the parent because the parent won't be safe so we need to ensure that the parent is safe and we need to think about how we can reassure the child that that is the case if the parent isn't safe then obviously we're triggering our, our, our kind of safeguarding um, wide referrals and taking those other hats on there um, what can parents do to support children who are worried about returning i think we've addressed that that's one that came up much earlier i really hope that was the, the crux of the session um, just looking down through to see if there's anything we haven't addressed um, Thinking about children who are returning after a really long break, so somehow will not be returning until September. I think here, turn towards all of your transition materials. Anything that you would normally do to transition children into school if they were coming for the first time, use this with every child. 
Um, this will be relevant for everyone right now. They might need reintroducing to the adults around them. They might need to be reintroduced to school and life and how school life works in your school and also to any new rules and policies. So again, trying to think, how can we make this feel more familiar? But a really good starting point. Most schools I work with these days have really good transition uh, practice. So think about your transition and your induction practice for your students um, and use it for everybody. Also, please think about the transition back in for your staff. So many staff I'm thinking, I'm working with right now, are feeling like massive imposter syndrome. They've been away for a long time too. And those butterflies that we all get at the beginning of the school year, everyone's feeling them big time. So it's not just about the kids here, it's about the staff. And where we've got cappy and confident staff who feel safe and feel able, then the children's confidence and happiness and safety will kind of follow. So think about your staff as well. Okay, where else are we going? Da, 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 da so many big questions in here. I'm just going to do a last couple because I'm very aware of time. We'll finish at half past. Um, there's a, uh, sorry to butt in, there's a nice question yeah, about how can we start a dialogue with adults and children's lives when there are anti-school too, so this is a high school setting. So when the adults are anti-school? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Why haven't I come up with that before? Great question, whoever asked that. So we do get this intergenerational uh, school avoidance issue. So if the family um, have a negative experience um, and relationship with the school, um, then it may well be that the child has learned this. So we will often find that um, parents who were school avoidant will have children who are school avoidant and there's something about learned behavior there there's also something about well if we don't think school's a great place we might feed into that even if um, actually at this point we're, we're relatively positive but here we're thinking about so there's a negative relationship between the family and the school and that's causing an issue so our key thing here is about building that relationship back up so all the things that we've thought about with the child how can we make sure they feel wanted in the school how can we do that for the family we need the family to rewrite their story here as a whole so it's not just the child's story that needs to be rewritten but the family's and if they've had a negative experience before how can we change their view on this let's actually stop and listen to them enable them to feel seen and heard and actually just stop for a moment and explore what are the challenges they faced why is this relationship difficult actually beginning to be able to have that conversation is the first hurdle you need to overcome and you might need to think about how do you reach out to that family can you meet them where they are and sometimes where they are will be that you're going to chat with them on Facebook maybe that's the one place you can engage them and um, it might not be that you can physically get them in actually visiting them uh, in their home if you've got a really kind of broken thing going on here having someone visit them in their home can be really helpful think carefully about who you send uh, you need someone who the family will not feel intimidated by so our family support workers are miracle workers here if we can begin to build trust there then that trust can be extended just like when we build attachments with children and those attachments can be transferred and multiplied it's the same with the adults as well where we have a family who are tricky for us to work with those who are most challenging for us, often if we invest the time, these are where we will seek the best rewards because these are often the families who become ambassadors for our school. These are the families who will tell other families this is a good place where your child will be held and heard. Um, it's really worth investing the time. Um, there's often generations worth of, of, of difficulty there and there'll be all sorts of different things at the heart of that, but taking time just to stop and listen and meet those parents where they are can begin to unpick this. If they've had bad experiences, why should they trust you? You're going to have to earn that trust. So that's the question to start with, really. How can we begin to earn that trust? Um, there's another question in here, which I thought was rather interesting. Not sure if you've seen it. Um, I'm supporting a child who has witnessed domestic violence against mum. And this is impacting the feeling of safety of going into school. How can we address this? I did that one, didn't I? Oh, you've done. Uh, I'm, I have been listening, but there's been so much information. No, that's um, okay. Okay, let's have one last one, one last one, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, da, da, da. I'm trying to think what's the best one to finish on. Um, Pookie, ah. can, we, can we do the one about the 14 year old son who regularly avoids school? Yes, where, can you read the, can you see the question? Can you read it? Sorry, there's so many yeah, in here. It says, I have a 14 year old son who regularly avoids school. He won't talk to me and he won't talk to a counsellor. How do I get him to open up? Because I'm in a similar situation. <laughs> First of all, I'm sorry to hear that, Elaine. And um, I, yeah, I, I, it's very hard. Um, 
So the, the, the two things I would suggest here are, um, we aren't going to be able to make a child talk to the person we choose, but we might be able to encourage them to engage with the person they choose. So just stop for a moment, think about their life and whether there are any adults there that you or they can identify with whom they've got something of a positive relationship. So this might be someone who they know through an activity that they really enjoy. Um, it might be a friend of a family, sometimes godparents, uncles, aunts can be good people here. It might be the football coach, it could be anyone. What you're looking for here is someone who the kid likes and who they can engage with and maybe engage with specific activities. So when we're doing things, it's often easier for these conversations to involve, unfold. Our job then stops being the person having the conversation, but rather thinking about how can I support this other person to begin? And we're not expecting them to fix it, but we can help, hopefully, ask them if they can act as a bit of a mentor, a bit of a guide, a bit of a support to help us understand where the problems are. Until we know what the problems are and what might be some positive first steps, it's very, very difficult for us to know how to help. So trying to identify who that adult might be um, would be my suggested first starting point. The other thing is, always to remember that it's not about us um, it's it's about the child and what works for them so it can feel really hard as a parent you want to be able to fix this you want to be able to make it okay um, and we can sometimes feel that if our child won't open up to us about this that that's a failing on our part often what's going on here is that you've got a child who cares deeply about you and they don't want to worry you or distress you and they, they don't want to explore this stuff with you because they don't want to hurt you. Um, and so sometimes having someone who's slightly removed from the situation can be really, really helpful. Um, you don't need to make a lot of progress to begin to feel like you are making progress and both you and the child often, once you begin to see some positive starts, um, often you find that that will build that cycle of, of I can um, and it all becomes a bit more possible. Does that help a little bit? Okay, it's half past five, so we will, we will end. Um, I really hope it was helpful, and um, Sophie will send you through all manner of things afterwards. If there was a question that wasn't addressed that you really want me to um, answer, do let Sophie know, um, and I can always do a further Q&A at another point, and we will do other sessions. Do feedback to us about how you would like these sessions to work, um, what, you find, what you would find helpful, and also what you think might be good topics for future conversations like this as well. Um, massive thank you from me to you for coming for staying for asking such great questions and for involving yourselves in the discussions um and and good luck with it um yeah remember that you can just to build on those positive moments look for the little glimmers of hope and uh, hold them tight thanks ever so much for your time everyone thanks for all that you're doing thanks pookie